Gentlemen of culture, the YouTube algorithm has brought us together once again. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of The Industry Outsider. I'm your host, Elle Grant, and today we're gonna to be talking about several things, like Grand Seiko releasing even more limited editions. I will be talking about the new lighter that I recently purchased, as well as the scotch that I'm currently drinking. I also wanted to answer some of the questions from the comment section of my last Outsider video, but before we jump into Grand Seiko's new releases, let's do a wrist check. Today I'm wearing my new Casio. It's just a fun little timepiece to have in my collection and it gives me major 80s vibes. I've recently been watching the current season of Stranger Things, so I've been loving the 80s nostalgia. Enough about my new toy, let's go ahead and jump into Grand Seiko's new releases. So Grand Seiko recently released more limited editions to the US market. Now, while I love Grand Seiko, and I freely admit that these are some really cool watches, I don't love the constant limited editions. And the reason why is pretty simple. If I really like a watch, I don't wanna be put in the position where I have to either buy it right now, regardless of what my financial situation is, or I miss out. A couple years ago, I missed out on the SBGH269 because I couldn't afford it at the time, and now it's no longer an option, which is probably for the best because truth be told, the watch was a little big for me, and I do have some misgivings about owning a Grand Seiko. When the exterior finishing is that good, you hate scratching the watch that much more. At least with most of my other watches, a minor scratch just feels like part of the journey. You know, signs of life. It just doesn't bother me as much, but with a Grand Seiko, it feels like it's damage. Regardless, these four new releases are limited to the US market, and I imagine that they will be gone before you can even blink. I will say that this hand-wound SPGK015 is amazing, but there's only 250 pieces of it, and at 7,500 bucks a pop, there will be a lot of people left wondering what it would have been like if they had just gotten there first. Yes, it is a stunning dial on a beautiful watch, but there's no surprise there, it's a Grand Seiko. But 250 pieces? I have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than I do getting my hands on one of these watches. 250 Grand Seiko? Come on, that's just cruel. Okay, I've said my piece about the Grand Seiko releases. Let's move on to some questions from my viewers. Question number one, what are your thoughts on Shinola watches? Well, I've only really seen a couple in person, the Runwell and the Runwell Automatic. And I've seen a couple of their new releases on the website, like the Duck and the Traveler, and I like what I see in terms of design, but I haven't actually seen those watches in the wild. Nevertheless, had any hands-on experience with them. There was a Shinola store at the mall that I go to, but it's currently closed. Supposedly, they're gonna reopen again, and maybe when they do, I'll go check them out. Anyway, I like the design language and the whole made in Detroit thing, but I do have to wonder if they're overpriced, especially for some of their quartz offerings. But again, I can't really say for certain because I don't have any hands-on experience with them. Perhaps they are worth every penny because of their build quality. In the future, they are definitely one of the companies that I wanna investigate more deeply. Okay, so let's move on to our next question. You seem to like a lot of guys' stuff. Do you like sports? So the short answer is no, but I'm gonna tell you guys a little story. So for those of you who are unaware, my occupation is server and I've been waiting tables for about 10 years. Last Saturday, I had the honor of waiting on an up and coming, very famous Eagles player. And I had absolutely no idea who he was. I was far more excited about the fact that he had a blinged out AP on his wrist because I'd never seen one of those in person than what the man did for a living. If that's not an accurate depiction of how I feel about sports, then I don't know what is. The worst part is that's not the first time this has happened. The Eagles come in all the time, whether it's the managers, the Eagles players, or the coaches. We constantly have the Sixers in, and then occasionally the Phillies come in too. And I don't know who any of these people are. I know that they're athletes because they're usually very large gentlemen, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> I just never really cared about sports and I never cared to learn. I have a lot of male interests, but sports is not one of them. So let's talk about my other new toy, my Douglas Field L Lighter. I do have an interest in EDC stuff and I definitely wanna start featuring some of those items on this channel in the near future. So the Douglas Field L Lighter design comes out of Japan. This thing is built like a tank 
phenomenal finishing. It's completely solid brass, so it will develop a patina over time, but I think that's just gonna add more character to the lighter. It has a pretty compact design, which is something that I really appreciate personally, because girls have notoriously small pockets. So on the days where I don't wanna carry around my purse, this is something that I can slip into one of my pockets and it's not big or bulky. Up until this point, I've mostly used butane lighters and had a couple Zippos. Now, butane lighters don't hold onto fuel as long as say a traditional lighter. And I've definitely noticed a difference between this and my Zippo. I've been playing around a lot with this lighter and I've actually only had to fill it up once. It's very user-friendly and easy to fill, and underneath the cap where you put the fluid in, there's actually a hidden compartment for an extra flint, which I wish I had known before I went to the smoke shop to buy more flint, but not a big deal now I know for future reference. And something else I should mention is I'm not really a smoker. The Hugh Hefner reference at the beginning of the video was just supposed to be for fun. So I'm not exactly sure how much use my lighter is going to get other than lighting the occasional birthday candle, but I have always liked the notes of tobacco and cigar box in wine. So who knows, I might take up the hobby. So now for our final segment, we're gonna talk about the scotch that I'm drinking today. Now, to be totally honest, I am more of a bourbon girl myself. I will drink bourbon all year round. I don't care if it's 90 degrees outside. I do enjoy scotch, but it is something that I have to be in the mood for. I don't have that much experience with scotch, but the ones that I have tried, I do enjoy. So I've had Oban, Belvini, and Macallan. But the other day I was listening to the Whiskey and Watches podcast and one of the guys was drinking this and said it was the perfect summer scotch. So naturally I was intrigued. This is Glenlivet Caribbean Reserve, which is a no age scotch whiskey, which is partially finished in aged rum barrels. I don't know a ton about Glenlivet. This is my first time trying any of their scotches, but from what I understand, they have a distinct honey characteristic. I will say with this scotch in particular, it's more of honeysuckle on the nose, papaya, and kind of an aroma of aged rum. As far as flavor profile goes, it's incredibly smooth and well-balanced. It has lively tropical fruit notes of bright mango and overripe banana peel. And as I sipped on it more, I definitely picked up on more of the honey note, but the tropical fruit notes are the prominent characteristic. It's definitely a lot sweeter than some of the other scotches I have tried in the past and doesn't have quite the same bite. Overall, I'm fairly happy with it. Look guys, I'm not a scotch expert and I'm certainly not pretending to be one, but at one point I was training to be a sommelier, so I feel like I have a fairly decent palette for this kind of stuff. Regardless, I am open to suggestions because I am new to the world of scotch, pretty well versed in bourbon, but I definitely need to work on my single malt scotch knowledge for work. So if you have any suggestions, please drop them in the comments down below. Well, that about wraps it up for this week's episode. As always, if you have any questions you'd like answered or any topics you'd like covered in future videos, let me know in the comments down below. I do try to respond to as many of your comments as I possibly can, but some of them require at least a paragraph, sometimes two worth of a response, so I can't always get to everyone. I do read most, if not all, of your comments, and just because you don't get a response from me right away doesn't mean that it won't be covered in a future video. But anyway, thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Industry Outsider. I'll see you guys next time.